Good evening and welcome to Public Affairs, Public Access on Houston Media Source TV. I'm Gene Preuss with the League of Women Voters of Houston. February is African American History Month and we commemorate almost 500 years of the African American experience in the United States. It's a story older than the U.S. itself. As we honor Black American struggles, tribulations, successes, and contributions to American history, we look forward to a prosperous future in the United States. Tonight, we'll talk about African American History Month with Don Caleb II. Don is a educator and a parent, and he'll discuss the importance of African American History Month in those roles. Miguel Caesar will also visit with us. He's the lead archivist and acting manager at the Houston Public Library's Gregory School, where he'll talk about preserving the past for the future generations. So thank you for joining us tonight, and we hope you're staying safe. Let's begin our discussion with Don Caleb II. With me this evening is Don Caleb II. Uh, and Don, you've been a public school teacher, and you're currently working, uh, going back to school to, to ramp up your degrees. Uh, we're celebrating Black History Month, African American History Month, uh, here in February. And so I wanted to get your perspective as a educator and as a parent uh, of the importance of African-American history. First of all, I mentioned two names, right? Black or African-American. Uh, names mean things. And can you, I know in the Latino community, uh, there's currently a debate over what do we call ourselves. Mm -hmm. But I, I understand that there's uh, changes also in how younger African-American uh, male students and females uh, see themselves and refer to themselves as opposed to a, an earlier generation? Uh, yeah, first off, I'd like to thank you for having me. Um, it, it's, it's an extreme honor to be here. Uh, but talking about the, the name African-American and Black, uh, <clears throat> and even when you talk about uh, Black History Month, African-American History Month, you know, it started off as like Negro History Week. So we've gone from Negro uh, with the with the with the month or with the celebration of our culture. We've gone from Negro to African American, and so like you said, now there's kind of a, a, a hotbed topic of just going with Black. So, like you said, the 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 younger generation, uh, <clears throat> we're kind of at an area of why do we need to be. Uh, why do we need to be recognized about where our ancestors are from? We're so far removed from that. Uh, we're African in DNA. We're African in, in you know, our, our, uh, of course, our, our skin tone. Uh, but we're so far removed from that. We're Americans. Um, and, you know, no matter how the country goes or how we're treated by the country, we're still proud to be American. So to try to separate us from just being Americans is kind of a slap in the face. And so that's where the whole issue comes from with the, with, with the name. Like I said, it went from Negro to African-American and now we're just saying, hey, we're just Americans. Well, that's really an interesting perspective. And, and, and you know, the names do change over time as, as you were pointing out. Um, why is it important as an educator, as a parent, to have to celebrate African American or Black History Month. <clears throat> so it's it's important because uh, you just can't separate uh, a people's history from a country that that you know they're a part of, that they help build, that they help create, and so there again, you know, there's been a, a big push to get people to recognize our accomplishments every day, you know, not just a month. But we also have to understand the importance of this month started by uh, Carter G. Woodson, 
it, it, it's important to highlight and, and to bring forth uh, specific things for our culture. So the importance of African-American history or Black American history, um, I've even heard some older people still call it Negro, you know, History Month. Um, but it's important because we are, again, like I said, we're Americans and our history matters and our culture matters. So we have to make sure that we also remain relevant in the, in the grand scheme of American history and American culture. So it's, it's very important uh, as an educator and as a parent myself um, for our children to know everybody, not just black children, but every race of children should know. And why is that? I mean, why you know, a lot of people think about American history, we should focus on the heroes, the George Washingtons, the Thomas Jeffersons, mm -hmm. the Abraham Lincolns. But why is it important to have for children of color to have people like them represented in history? Well, I, it, it shows that we have a place in, in history and, and, it's, and it's bigger than what we're usually taught of, of being an enslaved people. Uh, and so being able to see greatness in yourself in a perspective of the great nation of America is very key and very important uh, to every, to every uh, you know, minority, minority group in the United States. Just making sure that uh, we just make sure the kids know that, you know, history isn't just about the, the founding fathers. You know, it's about the people that helped the founding fathers get where they were. You know, most people don't know the story of, of uh, African-Americans or black men that participated in the American Revolution in large numbers. You know, most people don't know uh, about Prince Hall of the Black Masons how he was an abolitionist and how he was in the revolution and how he, him and his son helped squash uh, Shay's rebellion. So putting these in perspective, it allows the children to gain a different interest because history now looks like them. So as a teacher, what were some of the challenges you face <clears throat> in communicating uh, African-American history, not just on a, uh, on a one month or previously, as you point out, one week basis, but to integrating that into the curriculum? Well, of course, uh, in the society we are today, everything's big on testing. And so, uh, <clears throat> although, you know, I was a, a middle school history teacher, although, although the eighth grade history test wasn't really considered a passing standard, it played into the school's accountability rating. So it was difficult for me to go outside and bring in actual African-American history because if it's not in the curriculum, um, in the TEKS, uh, what the teachers go by, uh, Texas Essential Knowledge and Skills, uh, if it's not in there, then a lot of schools and a lot of uh, administrators were a little bit uncomfortable because, hey, we've got to get these kids to pass this test and we've got to get great numbers. So you spending time, you know, uh, someone's talking to me, you spending time bringing in this extra stuff. Hey, maybe you can reserve that for like after school or things of that nature. Did you uh, ever have uh, problems with the kids asking why you were focusing on uh, this other information, which was <clears throat> maybe not, uh, con not the same thing that they may have heard from like TV or other books? You, you know, I've never really had pushback and, and, and that's, that's what's really cool about it. I've taught in uh, several districts. Uh, most of the districts I taught in were urban districts. So, you know, the ones inner city. Um, and so I never really, you know, had a pushback with that. So uh, as the, one of the last larger districts I worked for, it was a uh, historically predominantly uh, white district. So, you know, there were a lot of uh, Caucasian students there, but I never got pushback from them. You know, they would come and tell me, you know, hey, you know, this is it's really interesting. I didn't know this. You know, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't think these kind of things, you know, uh, uh, existed or happened. Because, like I said, most of the time, uh, the story of blacks in America is enslavement, uh, emancipation, um, civil rights, and where we are now. 
you know, and there are so many gaps to be filled in in between those uh, categories that I spoke about. It's just a plethora of information. So a lot of kids uh, were blown away. Um, <clears throat> and, and so, you know, I, I probably should have taught a little bit higher. And so my aspiration is to hopefully get into college, but being in that, that, that middle school realm, um, you know, it kind of flew over some kids' heads, but uh, they would always beg me to follow them to the local high school, which I probably should have took their advice. You bring up a very interesting point in the discussion, and I want to circle back to this. Uh, you said right at the very beginning that <clears throat> African-American history, Black history should be considered American history uh, rather than seeing something different. There's a lot of people uh, who here are teaching Mexican-American history, African-American history, and they said, let's get rid of the hyphenation. It should just be American history. And so I think that it's interesting that you emphasize this point that Black history is American history, and it's the same themes. Um, how did you come to this, um, this place of, of seeing where African-American history fits into American history as a whole? I mean, you know, like I uh, said before, even, even with our enslavement, uh, even with you know, uh, the, 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 the things we went through as a people, still, that was, you know, we're, we're a key, probably the biggest part of, of, of why America is what it is. Um, and, you know, we can go, you know, we can have millions of discussions of, of why still the American economy is still the way it is, or, 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 or you know, why America sits where it is uh, economically, especially up high, built off the backs of slaves <clears throat> or enslaved people. Uh, but I came to a point, uh, and, and, I, and I can really say, I probably came to a point when, 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 when I was in, in, in undergrad, an undergrad student, uh, and I just really wanted to know more. You know, I wanted to know more than than the stuff that they that they always taught us. You know, they, you know, the 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 big three, you know, like Malcolm Martin and, and Rosa. Uh and so I was interested in that. And then especially being from Texas, Texas, you know, one of the largest states in the United States. And so hey, we had to play a role in this. So, you know, as as I'm teaching, uh I'm studying at the same time. I I, I taught uh Texas history and US history. Uh, which I think I had more fun teaching Texas history because seventh grade history is not tested. So it gave me more leeway to bring in these stories of these, you know, black conquistadors that people don't know about. Or it, it gave us the time to talk about uh, people like Estan Vinco who came in or uh, Olado Equiano, you know, all these different people that you can talk about. Um, but in saying all those names, they're American history, you know, um, and not just North American history. They, they played a big key role in Central America and South America. So there is no way to separate uh, Black history from American history. That, that is just not feasible. So you're a parent, and I know that you... Um want to instill these same things that uh, that you are learning that you're going through in your children in your boys but um you, you didn't necessarily get this information uh so much when you were in their place how do you see this as a parent uh, in expanding their minds to kind of ma make them uh have things that you didn't have or education that you didn't have well um so I, I, as, as a, a, a educator, as a uh, historian and as a parent, I, I, I just try to expose my children to things that, that, that I wasn't exposed to. Um, and uh, <clears throat> it's not that, that my parents, uh, you know, didn't know, my parents didn't know, uh, they, but they did. My parents, as of lately, as I talked to my parents and, and we have the discussion of, uh, integration and desegregation in Houston, um, you know, uh, I, I talked to my mother, she was part of the second integrating class in Houston. So my parents knew, uh, but 
Um, I think now, especially, and we're such in this 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 time that we're in, I can't even really call, you know, call it. But we're 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 in a, a weird time and a weird space in America, and so I really want to make sure that my sons are knowledgeable and and cognizant um, of the things that are going on um, as for with them. You know, they're they're young black males. And so I just really try to expose them in, in, in different ways. Uh, sometimes it's successful, sometimes it isn't because they're kids, you know. But uh, my, my, my 15 year old son uh, really surprised me because I follow him uh, on his social media. And the day that the insurrection happened at the Capitol, he posted on his Snapchat. And so, you know, I bust into his room and I was like, dude, you're actually listening to me. And so um, I think the kids are getting it. Um, and I think they're getting it a little bit better than we are. Uh, but I just still try to make sure that as a parent, um, I'm giving it to them in, in different ways. Yeah, you know, as you say, and, you know, maybe better than we are. Uh, I know you've had conversations uh, with other African American parents who question you on why you're so fixated on, you know, on the importance of African-American history. Now, that could be just because you're a historian, right? That history is your field. But uh, I, I think it goes beyond that too, right? Uh, it, it, it does. Um, it, it's just, of course, um, it, being a historian, it, it, you know, it's my field. It's just what I like to do, you know, um, you know, I find something and I fixate on it historically and I'm, I'm in it. Uh, but <clears throat> even, even outside of that, I just think that um, people, just, people just don't know things. And so I just take it upon myself to try to expose people. Because, I mean, even just not, you know, Black history. Like you said, I'm a historian. So... Um, you know, I'm trying to help people make sure they understand government so we don't fall into the trappings that we fell into before. You know, I'm trying to make sure that people know their rights. You know, I'm trying to make sure that, um, you know, people understand uh, about uh, different e economic things when it comes to where they live and things of that nature. So, um, but yeah, I, I've been questioned a lot, even by colleagues and stuff, uh, you know, um, even by friends, they'll tell me, hey, you're the one guy that can that can really ruin a party because somebody will say something and you giving us the historical rundown. I was like, well, yeah, I'm sorry. You know, this is a lifestyle for me. It's just a <laughs> hobby. So, you know, that's what I've been faced with. But again, you know, it, it people need to know. And so um, if I can take it one step at a time and, and educate as many people as I can, then, you know, that's that's what I do. Let me uh, ask you one, one more question. I know you're a big advocate of uh, historically black colleges and universities, HBCUs, uh, and they're yes. very important in uh, American and African-American and educational history. Uh, and I see right there on your, uh, on your sweater that you're wearing that uh, what do those letters mean? And, and what does that mean to African-American education? Okay, so um, the sweater I have on is my fraternity, uh, Kappa Alpha Psi Fraternity Incorporated, uh, founded 1911 uh, at Indiana University. Uh, and so the, we're, we're not, so fraternities and uh, HBCUs are not an all inclusive thing. So when I say that, like I said, we were founded at Indiana University. Um, you know, uh, Alpha Phi Alpha was founded at Cornell University. So we weren't just at black universities, um, but they play a key and important role in black history because of the things that they face um, and the reason why these organizations were started. Um, you know, so it, it, that, in a, that in itself is just a whole long conversation, but from us, our, our organization's being around, mine's been around since 1911. Uh, you know, we, we have many key members who, who've been a part of almost uh, every intricate part of, 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 of uh, American history after we were founded. Um, and so 
the key roles that fraternities play uh, is, 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 is a, a unity, uh, uh, a sense of pride, especially um, when you're at a place where you're not wanted. Um, and, and just also a, 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 a forever lifetime bond. You know, once, once you're in, you're in for life. Um, and so it's, 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 it's been a great ride for me. Uh, and and it's, it's, it's brought me a lot of uh, <clears throat> great brotherhoods and friendships. Um, on the HBCU aspect, uh, you know, they're important because we were denied education for so long. Uh, and and they, education is a tool and a, and a key to, to, to the future. And like, I, you know, I, I tell every kid that I've taught, um, go to school, flunk out, go back but go to school, go to college. Um, because even with the HBCU issue, again, we weren't allowed education. Uh, and so when these schools started, these were places that we were able to go um, in, the, in the mid 1800s, 1900s, where, you know, again, segregation was still going on. We were still in, some people were still enslaved. And, and, and so uh, to have that, again, another sense of pride in our community that's been around since about, I think the first HBCU was founded like in 1837. So for us, for these things to still be around right now, they're, they're a, a sense of pride for our community. Well, very well said. And I, I thank you for your time and for your comments and for your insight in, uh, in teaching and the importance of uh, African American History Month. Don Caleb II, thank you very much for your time. And uh, keep the faith, man. I appreciate what you're doing with history. Well, I appreciate you uh, having me on. Have a great night. You too, thanks. Today, my guest is Miguel Caesar. He's the lead archivist and acting manager at Houston Public Library's Gregory School. Mr. Caesar, welcome to Public Affairs Public Access on Houston Media Source TV. Thanks for having me. So tell us a little bit how. Um, are, are you from Houston? How did you find yourself as an archivist? Um, that's always a great question because no one really sets out to <laughs> become an archivist. So I actually went to Prairie View and M University. Once I graduated with a business degree, I went to grad school in the community development program at the School of Architecture. Uh, so during that time, I worked as a grad assistant at the Special Collection Archives at, uh, uh, at Prairie View and m University. And this is kind of where I kind of fell in love with archives. Um, so I actually worked there for about uh, two years as a, grad, as a graduate student and was able to uh, you know, process collections, digitize photos, learn history without having to teach it, so to speak, to, to actually just preserve it and just, you know, let it come to me at my own pace. And once I graduated with my master's degree in uh, community development, I decided I wanted to go back to school to get a master's in library science because I actually enjoyed the work I was doing as a grad student. And uh, once I went to Texas Women's University and got a master's in um, uh, library science, I actually worked at the Prairie View Archives and other departments in the library for about uh, eight years before I came to uh, the Houston Public Library's uh, African American Archives in 2013. So it's just kind of a random journey to to come to what this uh, to to I guess end up where we are now. So, just as some background for people who might be interested, how does one become an archivist? Um. I think the best way, and there's a lot of schools now that offer certifications and uh, different uh, certificates that are dedicated to uh, preservation. Um, it's mainly by, I would say, experience and, and volunteering and getting your name out there that people actually uh, know that you have that interest. You definitely, uh, I would say, you definitely would need a master's of library of science to to uh, solidify your professionalism in the field. Um, but even when you get that master's of library science degree, you have to make sure you're going to a school that uh, offers that archival component. 
But if not, that's when your experience and your volunteer uh, services come in to help shape, you know, your your professional career and your direction of your career. So when did you actually come to the Gregory School? Uh, 2013, I actually uh, came here as a processing archivist. And uh, I held that position for a couple of years. And, and my job and my duties at that time was to uh, go out, uh, acquire, preserve, and document African-American history in Houston, um, as well as the surrounding areas. Um, which entail digitizing photographs, um, uh, putting uh, older documents in the proper housing, access free folders, climate controlled uh, conditions, and things like that. When did the Gregory School open and, and, and how did it come to be? Uh, okay, great question. So the original Gregory School, then called the Gregory Institute, what is, uh, was established in 1870 uh, for children of formerly enslaved African-Americans in the Houston area. Uh, the elementary school is, was actually named after Edgar M. Gregory, which was a union officer um, of the Freemans Bureau for Texas. Uh, we're actually located in Freemanstown's fourth ward, uh, which is considered the, uh, well, not considered, which is the city's oldest African-American uh, community. Um, our current brick facility was built in 1926. Uh, it serves the community uh, as a school until, I think, 1984. Um, then HPL acquired the property from the Houston Independent School District, um, which, uh, once it was finally renovated, it reopened in November of 20, uh, 2009 um, as the African American Library that we know today. And it's also the first of its uh, the first of a well the first African American library of its kind in Houston, uh, but it's also one of the very few African American resources uh, in the United States. And uh, it's actually the main goal of this facility uh, is to promote and celebrate the rich history of African Americans uh, in Houston and as well as Texas. And we do have a little bit of stuff on Louisiana as well. So it's Houston uh, kind of writ large. It's not just uh, the greater Houston area or even uh, in, in, the, in the beltway, right? Or in, in the loop, as, as Houstonians like to call it. Um, so it sounds like you have a broad collection there. And, and, and you say it, it is, a, the, the library is fairly new. It's uh, been there, what, 10 years now, uh, opened in 2009. Um, and you were mentioning some of the resources. Let's talk about some of those resources from various parts of uh, Houston, uh, the county, and even, as you were saying earlier, Louisiana. What types of resources would someone want find if they went to the Gregory Library? Uh, yes, sir. Well, we, uh, as a research center, the library provides a, a variety of resources, including reference books, uh, rare books, archival materials, we have exhibits, artifacts, uh, or histories, and we also offer um, innovative programming. The collection will focus uh, more on African-American studies as it relates to Houston, but also Texas, I think I mentioned a couple of times. Um, but it, it definitely provides access to a, a variety of formats, uh, such as de uh, databases, microfilms, books, journals, uh, we have a pretty good collection of African-American uh, newspapers, uh, such as the Informer, uh, the Forward Times, um, the Houston Defender. Uh, we also offer uh, just a little bit more about our oral history. So uh, the, Gregory School, the Gregory School's uh, historic collection is very dependent on oral histories. Uh, we get a, a wealth of information from the community just coming in to Tell us the story about how it was growing up, you know, in uh, specific time periods, uh, whether it was actually going to the Gregory School or going to an event uh, in Houston. So those are very, uh, very important to us. We also um, offer programming uh, when we were open and also online right now. We try to offer programming about two to four times monthly uh, that relate to the archival collection. 
and also important African American issues. Uh, we also offer tours. Um, we're working on getting a virtual tour set up, but uh, when things resume, we would book tours for the community. Uh, we have the first floor would feature our historic uh, classroom and three permanent galleries that show the, the growth of African American community and the contributions that they made in Houston, as well as at the end of the hall, we would feature a art gallery that was uh, usually curated twice a year that just kind of focus on national um, national art, uh, different topics. So not necessarily tied to Houston, but it, it brings in that the international as well as national, um, I guess, uh, aspect to the Gregory School. Let me ask you about something you said uh, as part of your collections. Did I hear you right in saying that there are red books? Um, we do have uh, <laughs> the book called uh, The Red Book. Can uh, you explain to the uh, viewers what that is, what that means? Uh, well, <laughs> so The Red Book is one of our red books, <laughs> I should say. Um, so this was a, a book that kind of documented a lot of the African Americans uh, first and significant milestones uh, in the city. I wanna say we might have a copy online that you can see, but you can definitely contact us and you know we'll can right now we can we're doing remote reference so we can actually digitize some pages for you. We can have remote document viewing to see uh, some of the images or some of just some of the information that's in there. Um, so we uh, we have several collections, uh, such as the Houston Local Author Collection. So anyone who's writing books, you know, pertaining to Houston or just even personal books, we do have a space to to add that to our collection and re, you know have that reserved for anyone who wants to come in and see their books. Now, all books do not make it to the catalog, <laughs> so. Um, you know, it, it definitely has to fit our collecting scope, but if it fits our scope as well as Houston Public Library's collecting scope, it can be added to the catalog. But at the very least, it will be documented and stored uh, at the Gregory School. What can you share with us if it is February, uh, African American History Month, Black History Month in the United States, and we certainly celebrate here in Houston? Uh, tell us a little bit about that. What else? Uh, other kinds of history do you have there? Um, that's a, a, a good question. So mainly we have what we get from the community. And that's the, that's the, that's the balance that we have to play with the community because um, like I said, the galleries in, on the first floor will tell stories of the first families that came here and set up churches, uh, universities, uh, and just kind of document what actually what the African American community actually had to offer, because as you understand, once once they settled for uh, Freemanstown or Fourth Ward, we call it, uh, it wasn't part of the city, so it wasn't incorporated into Houston uh, city limits. It was considered the outskirts, the swampy land. Hence, that's why it actually still floods closer to downtown because it, it's actually grown to come out and encompass full floor and, you know, on to um, I-10 and uh, I think we're bordered by 45. Um, so with that being said, the black community didn't get the support of having the roads paved. So they... Um, they bought bricks and actually paid the streets themselves. They actually put up their own lights. Uh, Fourth Ward was just the epic center of African-American life and culture, uh, period. And it was a very self-sustaining community. And it was just kind of its own city. And you, know, you didn't have to leave for anything. You had your own doctors here. You had your own grocery stores here, your own entertainment, and it, it's, we, we want to shed light on that. And we actually have, like you said, a lot of information, especially in those uh, newspapers that were only able to, uh, they were only documenting African-American events, so to speak, and, and bigger events. But you couldn't go to the Houston Chronicle or the Houston Post 
and see what was going on in the African American community. You had to rely on, I guess, just the African American newspapers and news outlets from uh, sources uh, from that, uh, I guess, aspect. It's, it's very important that we keep and document, you know, these instances because uh, African American history is everyone's history. It's not just African American history. So everyone's welcome, you know, regardless of, you know, race or profession. We have students come in and do research. We have just regular community members come in and do research. Um, you know, everyone, we have, uh, usually we'll get tours, uh, senior citizen tours, love to come by, church tours. Uh, just the community as a whole is, is very welcome to just walk in and we'll be able to find something for you. What other kinds of special resources might uh, someone find there? Any standout collections, any famous Houstonians that we should know more about? Okay, so one of my personal favorite collections will be uh, the John S. Chase Papers. Uh, so this collection contains over 700 photographs and blueprints that document uh, his career. So John Chase was the first African-American to attend um, graduate school at the University of Texas School of Architecture. He actually received his, he was the first African-American to receive his master's uh, from that program in 1952, uh, which made him um, the first licensed African-American architect in Texas and actually helped co-found the National Organization of Minority Architects along with six other black architects. Um, we also have a, a collection from Ben DeSoto, who was a photojournalist for the Houston Post as well as the Houston Chronicle, which documented race and class within you know, Houston's ever-changing landscape. Uh, but his collection is focused mainly on uh, Fourth Ward and Fifth Ward in the early 80s, probably through the, the late 90s. Uh, another great collection we uh, acquired is called the uh, uh, Albert Halsey Collection, Photograph Collection. Uh, he was a, um, a Vietnam veteran who actually photographed Houston as well, uh, mostly in the Fourth Ward area, uh, and various uh, veteran parades, uh, and traveled the United States uh, doing this as well at, at other veterans parades. So we we have we've been a we, we've been able to collect a lot of interesting collections. I think we've uh, acquired up to about 400 plus uh, digital collections as well as oral histories and uh, manuscript collections. So let me go on to talk about the oral history collections. Uh, is this an ongoing project or, or how do you collect the oral histories? You know, so I, if, if my, let me let me backtrack a little bit here to start off. Um, I don't know that everybody knows what an oral history is, but if you're watching this show right now, this is essentially the same, uh, very similar to what an oral history is. So uh, tell us a little bit more from an archival standpoint, uh, what what we mean by oral history. Um, so oral histories are short stories um, that takes you back in time, and it's from a personal perspective of someone who actually experienced the events. So we would bring, uh, for an example, the process would work, uh, someone would call us and say, hey, uh, you know, I would like to do an oral history. So at that point, we would send them out pre interview questions to kind, kind of get some basic information, where you live, where did you grow up, when did you graduate? And um, then we would talk to them to see about what stories that they would you know, like to talk about. So then you can use this uh, pre-interview format to kind of jot down your stories so you can kind of um, stay on track to what, you, what it is that you're actually trying to tell us. But at the same time, uh, our job as archivists will be to give uh, a lot of open-ended questions to let the information just you know, flow. We don't want to, you know, it's not our job to kind of you know, dictate or, or I guess for a better word, to uh, drive a story in a certain direction or, or get you to talk about, you know, a, a certain event. We kind of just let you tell your story 
And a lot of people don't understand that uh, that it, it works with, it goes hand in hand with the archival collection because like you said, you can read a book about, you know, let's say the segregated schools and things like that, but you read that book and then you put in all history with someone who actually had these experiences that you can hear, you know, you know, live and vivid from their, I don't want to say imagination, but from their recollections, uh, it just makes learning that more uh, inclusive, together, complete, and it just gives a, a different feel to the history. And also, it's very important in the African American community because a lot of stories were passed down this way, uh, mainly because uh, the African American culture wasn't documented very well for a long time. So. Uh, a lot of the wealth is actually residing, you know, in people's memories. So that's why it's very important that we, we, you know, sit down with the community to get these stories out. And you also, you don't have to be an older, uh, you don't have to be an older person. We take young people all the time, you know, you know, people doing great things and want to document that. So, you know, if you think you have a story, you would like to, you know, talk to an artist about, definitely contact us and, you know, let us be the judge of what we think uh, is of historical significance. Because a lot of people have a lot of information that they just don't believe is worth anything. And nine times out of 10, that is definitely not the case. And, you know, it's our job to find value in things that you don't see the value in. Well, that's very, that's very interesting. And so, uh, and I'm, I, I really love oral history. So thank you for going into that. Um, so say that my family has um, a person maybe has died or is getting older. And um, how do I get to preserve that collection with the Gregory School or one of the other libraries if it, if it may not fit? I mean, I guess... You guys have uh, certain criteria of what goes into each library. How do I, how do I get a collection that I think is important to you? So we are still a actively collecting institution, and uh, this can be done in a couple ways. Uh, you can actually email us at hpl.gregoryschool.houstontx.gov and just jot down, you know. I, I have some items, some photographs, books that I would like for you to take a look at, and we will give you a call back and set up what we call a uh, a donor meeting. Well, also, just um, if you you know you don't use a computer, you don't want to use the computer, you can always just pick up the phone and give us a call, and uh, and that number will be eight three two three nine three one four four zero, and uh, we'll make. You, we'll definitely make this information available to you. But we have a website that you can go to as well um, on the Houston Public Library's website, and you'll find the African American Library, and you can find a, a wealth of information that will help you do that. But the main thing, we the easiest way is just to give us a call, and we'll set up a donor meeting, and that's where we'll talk about the items that you have. And then we can assess what uh, will be good for the collection and, and what's not. But also, you don't have to um, you don't have to determine this yourself either. If you just want to box up a whole bunch of newspaper clippings, photographs, you know, journals, journals, memoirs, uh, you can just box up what you have. Let us know. Uh, we can make arrangements. Even during COVID, uh, I'm sorry. Even during COVID, we can make arrangements to take collections, and we will go through and determine what has research value. And, um, you know, we'll, we'll put things from the collection and we'll also, you know, make a separate um, pile, so to speak. And we will give that back to you and give you the option and say, okay, this did not fit the collecting scope, but these items will fit the collecting scope. So it's, it's, it's I guess, labor as tensive as you, as you want to make it or easy breezy, just drop it off to us and we'll, we'll generate the collection from what you give us. You know, as a, I'm a professional historian, and as a historian, one of the things that um, it is always very important to us is finding uh, archival collections um, 
because oftentimes you'll find real diamonds in the rough. The sad thing is, I think, is that a lot of families and a lot of people, just run of the mill people say, well, my family wasn't special. My grandfather, my grandmother, you know, didn't do anything, you know, important. Um, but but, but th those are important as well, uh, because oftentimes we find things in those oral histories or those document collections that are, are just really telling. What do you say to people whenever they think, ah, you know, this stuff isn't important. Well, just, you know, grandma or aunt or uncle's stuff uh, that you guys can't find any use for that. How do you talk to people like that? Hopefully I can catch them before they decide to, <laughs> to throw things away. And like you said, it's always the older generation um, that documented everything. So I would say, like I said, like if you're, you know, your grandparents and your mom, uh, you know, unfortunately when people pass, the younger generation, kids might, you know, not live in the same state. So they just want to come in, clear out the house, throw things away. Uh, please look us up we will take you know everything you know just to to make sure that doesn't happen so uh i would tell anyone who, who thinks like you said they don't have uh, value in in collection is that you're just the fact that you live through these experiences is what we're documenting we're not here just to document you know, the famous people of Houston or uh, notable African-Americans. We're here to get the everyday story of the everyday people because that helps paint a, a broader picture of what was going on. You know, we it's, it's just as important to know how, you know, the classroom look from one of our, our oral histories where they can recall, they, they come into our school and, do a whole history and they can tell us, okay, yeah, the cafeteria is right there. Mrs. So-and-so's office was right here. You know, this was there. You know, we we would never get that type of insight. Uh, as well as, like I said, going away items. You know, we we are the experts in the deter to determine what is relevant for researchers. So you don't have to do that. You know, if, if you know, you're coming to clean out someone's house, or you, whether it's a parent, a loved one, or a friend, or you know someone who's going through that, and you know this person collected, you know, newspaper clippings, uh, photographs, programs, or anything, you know, to to do history justice, it will be, you know, ideal for you to just look us up, give us a call. We can come pick up stuff. Uh, we can make arrangements for you to drop things off. But it, like you said, it's, it's, an, it's very important that everyone understands that uh, whoever collected that stuff thought it was important. Even you may not, you know, and you might think it's just paper, but your loved one took time to sit there, cut those clippings out, make a scrapbook, um, put things in a, a, a shoebox and kept over the years, you know, it's, honor them by just bringing to someone to take a look at to see if we can see what they saw in those items. So I, I think, yeah, that you, you can not talk about that enough because that's a lot uh, of where the African-American history is uh, residing at this point because once again, African-American history and a lot of minority histories just was not well documented in the past. So it is in people's closets and attics and in garage. So yeah, it, it's just just give us a call and talk to us before you decide to throw away uh, anything. You know, I think that's uh, that's an important message, and I thank you for sharing that because you're absolutely right um, about two things you said. Going back earlier, talking about oral history, um, not everybody wrote things down, right? Not everybody has a documentary trail. Um, but there's a lot of great photographs. There's a lot of, of great family stories, uh, family recipes um, that oftentimes, you know, and, and it's not just people who are, are passing on and uh, cleaning, you know, cleaning out their stuff, but people who are downsizing their houses, people who have been scrapbooking and collecting for a long time. Uh, and they have collections, as you were saying, you know, people collect things for a reason. And um, I think that's important. It's important to preserve that because, 
uh, as you're saying, you know, there's there's a lot of good stuff that otherwise would disappear from the historical record. Let me ask you a question. One of the things I've noticed when I've been to the Gregory School, one of the things that I really appreciated, I do educational history, and um, there is a preserved classroom in the Gregory School that kind of transport us back to what it might have been like for students who attended there. Uh, what you know, what they would have seen when they walked into a classroom. What other kinds of exhibits do you often have uh, at the Gregory School? And um, so, talk about that first. Then I, want, then I want to talk about what are we doing now in in the time of COVID. Um, I guess so. We are we we do have three permanent galleries, uh, and I think uh, uh, earlier I was speaking how they are designed to. Um, the show African American contributions to that they've added to Houston. So, um, the first one when you start off, when you come for a tour, you go through the restored classroom, which is like you said, a 1926 setting of what it would look like to go uh, to to go to a class during this time period. Uh, you go through that door; it's going to lead you into the first gallery, where you'll see a a, a timeline. A significant African-American events uh, from the first churches, from the first schools, from uh, uh, notable contributions for African-Americans. And it's more specific, uh, specific to what, you know, uh, I guess the time period. So it gives you a better, uh, a better sense of what was going on and exactly what time period this was going on. Uh, then we also have the second gallery which is uh, dedicated to, um, I want to say, uh, cooperation and economics and things of that nature. So you'll, you'll find, I guess, exhibits and people along this gallery that, you know, uh, contribute to, to music, open uh, organizations, uh, social organizations, um, as well as, uh, uh, music you'll find in there, and you'll find more churches in this, uh, in the second gallery as well. You'll see a original map of, of Fourth Ward, so you can kind of visualize uh, Fourth Ward as, uh, as well as Freemantown, because uh, Freemantown, Freemantown is just a historical neighborhood within the historical uh, Fourth Ward. So you, uh, to see that original map, Will definitely help, and it'll show the Gregory School and, and how the original layout of the land was during that time. Um, then you move into the third gallery, which is uh, just kind of some sums up the rest of the, the other two galleries, where you can just get a feel of uh, more photographs that come from our collection. So you'll you'll see kids, women, children that shows a, a different perspective of African American life. Um, to show that, it, I guess, and I had to say this to a lot of people, that, you know, their African-Americans did create, you know, they, they did have good lives. Like, it was not all bad. And you can see this during the photograph, you know, they, they weren't all slaves, they weren't all poor. You can see that uh, once we were free people, they actually did very well for themselves. So we make sure we show that side because it's uh, too often you don't get a chance to actually see that. So we have a, a bunch of photographs that show uh, people at picnics, uh, having nice cars, always being dressed up, having things, you know, just not such a gloomy, uh, uh, depiction that we kind of get from history. So we're, we're here to shine light to the fact that there was a lot of good going on during uh, uh, during this time also. One of the nicest uh, events that uh, sticks in my memory is a number of years ago, you had a, a group of Tuskegee Airmen and some nurses, um, and they came in and they spoke. We're telling stories about their experiences. So that's definitely part of our, our innovative programming. We we go out and try to get, you know, programming based on the community as well as the African American interest uh, on a local level as well as a state level and national level. Um, uh, even to, uh, I guess this month for Black History, 
we actually have uh, four programs that you can sign up from the Houston Public Library's website as well. Um, the first one is uh, the importance of the African-American family, which is uh, Thursday, February 4th at 6.30, which um, is with a genealogist named Deborah Sloan. Uh, and she will you know, teach us how to get started in genealogy and tracing your roots. Uh, that, that's going to be a great uh, lecture slash workshop. Uh, Thursday, the following Thursday, February 18th, we have uh, The Color of Debt, Cemeteries and Black Families. Mm -hmm. So this will be uh, given by Texas Southern professor, uh, Professor Meeks, uh, which is a friend of the Gregory School, and she will be excited to show how uh, cemeteries have operated when it you know, comes to African-American burial grounds. The next program, I, will, I believe, will be on February 25th, will be uh, COVID-19 and the global pandemic and the impact on Black families. So this will kind of talk with, uh, and this is uh, uh, Dr. Farrah, she's an associate professor from, I think, uh, Prairie View and m University. Uh, so she will kind of discuss the impact that COVID-19 has uh, had on the Black community and the Black family structure itself. I feel like I'm forgetting one. I'm not sure. Okay, yeah, I think that, that oh no, I did forget one, I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> it's the, the one I forgot to mention was going to be on Thursday, February 11th. Uh, also at seven o'clock, and these are all uh, remote uh, program. Uh, and this will talk about, um, I think it was based on uh, 20, uh, Black perception of interracial sex in the 20th century. So it, it kind of explores the, uh, the, the interracial sex of the native population as uh, it relates to the African-American population. I think uh, it, <laughs> in the Black community, it, it explores that a, a lot of uh, African-Americans would say, you know, well, I had Indian in my family, and my great-grandma was Indian in my family. So it's going to talk about that connection and how that is true in certain cases. I really appreciate your time, Mr. Miguel Caesar, lead archivist and acting manager at Houston Public Library's Gregory School. Thank you so much for your time and for your stories about the Gregory School. Thank you, sir. I appreciate the time. Well, that's the show for this evening, and I want to thank our special guest, Don Caleb II, for his insights on uh, African American History Month, both as a teacher and as a parent, and Miguel Caesar, the lead archivist and acting manager at the Houston Public Library's Gregory School. For more information, you can go to the Houston Public Library main page at houstonlibrary.org. For the League of Women Voters of the Houston area, I'm Gene Preuss. Thank you for watching Public Affairs Public Access on Houston Media Source TV. Good night. Thank you.